Well, welcome everybody to this terrible Sunday of, a, of an afternoon. I hope you're all very snuggled wherever you are in whatever room you've got. And it's um, a deep fug. I mean, that's not the best thing for the climate, but it's certainly what you need, sadly. Uh, and welcome everyone for this Fabian session. Uh, I came across Matheson in a um, self-promotion exercise that the university does where it, it puts out um, LinkedIn articles about work that various scholars are doing. And I saw he was also presenting a paper at one of the talk in the pub sessions that they have. And it struck me as being a very worthwhile topic, a very, very um, imaginative topic, looking forward into a world where new democracies are having to be imagined. And in New Zealand, we have to look at that in terms of our unique position as a multicultural and treaty-based society. So I was looking forward to having uh, to, to getting a response from Matheson, and sure enough, he came across them, and we have the session tonight. Uh, I'll ask Matheson to just say a few words about himself, and, and then we'll go on with uh, the presentation. Thank you, Matheson. Very good. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, ko Matheson Russell, toko ingoa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Phil. Um, yes, I was pleased to get Phil's invitation and a chance to uh, present this talk uh, to, to the Fabian Society. Um, I mean, maybe just a little bit about me before I begin. I'm actually Australian. Um, please don't hold that against me. I've been here in Aotearoa for about 15 years now, and I'm, I, I have citizenship, so um, that's a step in the right direction. Um, I'm married to a Kiwi. We have two small boys now. Um, I teach philosophy at the University of Auckland. These days, I'm mostly teaching um, social and political philosophy. At the right at the moment, I'm teaching in a large stage one course called Ethics and Justice. I teach a course called Power, Critique and Emancipation. Um, and I'm teaching a unit at the moment on social epistemology. Uh, so that's a little taste of the sorts of things that I, I'm involved with. But my main interest at the moment actually is in democratic theory. Um, and it's a very interesting time to be thinking about democracy. Um, as you all know, around the world, democracy is experiencing, well, some people are calling it a crisis, um, something that, that's in its death throes. Um, others are seeing this as, as a moment of opportunity and potential transformation. I mean, certainly at the end of the Cold War, we were, we were told that this was liberal democracy had won the day. Uh, the communist cause had been defeated. This is the end of history. Um, and, um, and yet today, as you all know, uh, democracy is experiencing um, its vulnerabilities and um, challenges um, all around the, the globe. Um, there are perceived weaknesses in the way that our democratic systems are functioning today, their inability to solve uh, persistent issues, social issues, issues of um, economic inequality, uh, failures to really tackle uh, long-term problems such as the climate crisis and other ecological crises. Vulnerabilities as well, I think are widely perceived that um, our existing systems and democracy are vulnerable to corporate capture, to private interests, to um, weaponization by uh, majorities, uh, and also to the distorting effects of misinformation and disinformation in the new media environment. Um, and the consequences of these, I think uh, this waning trust in political institutions globally has helped to kind of aid the cause of ascendant authoritarianism um, and uh, low levels of trust in government also translating into um, lower voter turnout. Now, all of those uh, are features of um, social life and political life that we have a version of here in Aotearoa as well. Um, in some cases, not as pronounced as overseas, uh, but um, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that there are um, signs that our own political institutions um, are failing to, uh, to provide solutions to long-standing problems. Uh, and there is a sense of frustration with the way that the political system functions, um, not least the, the, the kind of um, ever-present display of partisanship and point scoring between politicians in the public sphere. So, so that's um, the global scene. And of course, here, here in Aotearoa, we also have, a, I think, to my mind at least, the most important conversation going on around democracy is the conversation around constitutional transformation. 
um, and uh, colleagues here at the University of Auckland are planning a large conference later in the year um, a corridor around constitutional transformation and thinking about ways in which the, um, the political arrangements here in Aotearoa could be revised and reformed um, in order to uh, redress historical wrongs and to better reflect um, treaty obligations. Uh, so, so I think this is a really uh, good time to be thinking about uh, where we're up to with, with uh, our political institutions, the ways in which they could be reformed even quite radically, um, particularly in the local context as, we, as this conversation about constitutional transformation unfolds over the next few years. I think that um, the main game there is the question around satirity and um, what we want our political life to look, look like going forward. But there's an opportunity there as well, I think, to reflect upon the uh, vulnerabilities and deficits of our existing political institutions um, and perhaps an opportunity to rethink um, how they're arranged and what they look like. So um, that's sort of the backdrop to, to what I'm talking about tonight. Um, and so I thought I'd start with just a little bit about the concept of democracy. This is, um, I guess, the sort of conceptual basis that I work from when I'm thinking about democracy, um, which, is, which is useful, I think, to, to reflect upon it only briefly what democracy is and why we might um, think that democracy is to be valued um, just because I think there is some confusion, I'm sure not among you, um, but there is confusion in, in the broader society about why we should even value democracy uh, and what democracy means. So um, I think basically speaking to me, um, the, the best starting point is with the concept of democracy as it was historically understood. Um, that is uh, as um, demos and kratia in the Greek, which means uh, the people and power. Essentially, the people have the power, the people rule in some sense. Um, there's a nice definition of democracy given by a political theorist, Wendy Brown, who says democracy simply means the rule of the people. And it contrasts with aristocracy, oligarchy, tyranny, and also with the condition of being colonized or occupied. The term democracy carries a simple and purely political claim that the people rule themselves, that the whole rather than a part or an other is politically sovereign. So um, I think that's a nice way of, of characterizing democracy. It highlights that democracy is gonna contrast with different conceptions of who should rule. Um, it's not a monarch, it's not the wealthy few, it's not even the best among us um, who rule, but all of us. Um, it contrasts with rule by a faction of the people. For instance, the whites or the elites or the working class even, um, a dictatorship of the proletariat. The people is a universal category, including all across um, social divisions of class, race, gender, et cetera. And it also contrasts with rule by a foreign power, imperial or, or colonial. So essentially democracy, as I conceive it, in its most basic form is simply a term to denote self-government. Um, it's the body of citizens as a whole, taking care of its own affairs, undertaking the activities of government for itself. So um, why is democracy desirable? Again, I'm sure that um, I don't have to convince you of this, but um, I think the way to um, essentially conceive of the value of democracy um, is relatively straightforward and I think quite hard to defeat. That is the desire for democracy in all of us springs from a kind of legitimate emancipatory interest. We all have a legitimate interest in um, not being dominated by tyrants, elites, factions, or foreign or colonial powers. So, or to put it positively, we all have a legitimate interest in establishing and maintaining a cooperative system of self-governance. Um, and of course, within that system of self-governance, there's no good reason why any particular individual or group of citizens should hold more sway in setting the course of how a government operates um, than any other. Um, so out of considerations of fairness and out of a desire to secure a situation of non-domination, um, we should enjoy equal power within that cooperative system of self-governance. So arguments of this kind, I think, quite logically lead to the conclusion that in principle, a democratic form of political association is 
in some deep sense, really the only normatively justifiable arrangement, the only form of political association that nobody could reasonably reject. Um, but notice that what, I, what I've said about democracy so far hasn't um, in any way kind of told us how democracy should be organized. Um, it doesn't tell us what's required for citizens to exercise political authority collectively. Um, it doesn't say what equality is going to amount to. It simply says that the form of political association um, in which the people collectively and as equals take upon the, themselves responsibility for governance um, is a desirable kind of um, state. And it's at this point, I think that we, we tend to fall into something of an error in our, in our modern context, um, because we've been taught that democracy means a particular kind of thing. It means um, election of a set of representatives who make decisions on our behalf, and it means um, a majority rule. Uh, so uh, holding elections is um, the definitive mark of democracy as we, as we understand it today. But um, again, democracy means that we are collectively and, and equally empowered to govern. It doesn't mean that we must decide by a particular mechanism of voting. Um, so mass voting in the form of elections or referendums, referenda, is one way of, of kind of realizing the ideal of democracy. Um, but it's not the only way. Um, and, and we shouldn't confuse a particular decision procedure, a particular political um, instantiation of the idea of democracy with the idea of democracy itself. Um, and one way to, to kind of illustrate this actually is to recall how democracy was organized in ancient Athens, um, which is often referred to as the birthplace of democracy, although of course, democracy was practiced in many forms in um, many human societies for a long time prior to um, the Athenian democracy. Uh, but it is a kind of paradigm case that's often, often referred to. Um, and in Athens, as you know, all citizens were able to participate in the business of politics, um, bearing in mind that the Athenian democracy excluded women and slaves. Um, and we all know that the citizens of Athens were able to participate as one large group in the ecclesia in political decision-making. Um, but actually, most of the business of political decision-making in uh, classical Athens didn't take place in the, in the large assembly. It took place, it was um, delegated as it were to working groups, um, councils, such as the Boule, which had 500 members, uh, which set the agenda for assembly meetings, uh, the Nomothetai, which is the legislative body, and the Dicasteria, which were a series of courts that were also um, um, populated by the citizens, often involving hundreds of citizens. And the thing about the Athenian democracy, which I wanted to mention and, and really underscore, is that um, the membership of these bodies, these councils, courts, etc., uh, wasn't decided by elections. It was decided by sortition, which is the process of random selection. So each year, a panel of about 6,000 citizens was randomly selected from the full body of citizens. And from that panel, uh, indiv individuals were then chosen by lot to become members of these bodies for a return for a term, and then they would rotate through these roles. Um, so most uh, citizens in ancient Athens were likely to participate as a member of one of these bodies at some point in their adult lives. Italian city states of the Renaissance, like Florence, also used lotteries in some parts of their political systems, making random appointments to lawmaking bodies and other bodies. Um, and in fact, during this period, lotteries or sortition was thought to be an essential tool for preventing any faction from manipulating political decision making um, and, in, and for protecting the integrity of political processes. So um, that's just to kind of say that there, there are ways in which democracy can be organized um, that don't would look quite different to our, our modern democracies. And in fact, an, an ancient Athenian who was teleported into the present um, and given a tour around our existing political institutions, probably wouldn't recognize them as democratic at all, actually. Certainly for the, for the ancient Greeks, um, democracy was almost synonymous with lottery, with sortition, and the involvement of ordinary citizens in political decision-making. Um, and so we would have to make a pretty um, strong case uh, to, no, no, this, we do count this as a democracy for these reasons. 
Um, but, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is that it's on one hand illustrates um, just how different democracy can look and has looked historically in different times and places. And secondly, also uh, because it turns out that uh, over the last decade or two, sortition or lottery has made something of a comeback. And I wanted to spend um, a few minutes actually giving you some information and some uh, case studies of the ways in which uh, sortition has been used in democratic experiments and innovations around the world as we speak. So um, one quite well-known case, um, some of you will, will be aware of this, is um, in 2016, in Ireland, the Irish government commissioned 99 randomly selected citizens who were broadly representative of the diverse Irish population to take part in a citizens assembly, as it was called. They met over several months to deliberate and consider the issue of abortion law in Ireland, which as you all would be well aware, is a very controversial topic um, in, a, uh, in a place with such complex religious history as Ireland. The, uh, the 99 citizens met over the course of a year, once a month, a weekend a month, um, to hear from uh, law experts, from doctors, um, from um, other uh, individuals who, who had information and experiences to share with them. Um, and they deliberated over the issue and ultimately um, generated a set of recommendations um, overwhelmingly actually that, that the abortion laws in, in Ireland ought to be reformed and liberalized. The, the politicians who observed the process um, were incredibly impressed with the, the seriousness with which the citizens um, engaged in the deliberations. They were impressed with the quality of the deliberations uh, and uh, the sophistication of the recommendations that emerged. Uh, and the, the work of the citizens assembly helped to convince the elected politicians that they should put the issue to a referendum and the referendum passed um, leading to a constitutional amendment in 2018. This kind of process uh, is usually referred to in the political science literature as a mini public. It's a randomly selected diverse set of citizens who um, are brought together to do a particular piece of work um, and usually to, to issue recommendations on a particular policy question. Uh, the OECD has a special unit that's been tracking the use of, of mini publics like this, citizens assemblies, they're also called citizen juries, citizen um, panels. And in the last 10 or 15 years, the uh, around the world um, mechanisms, processes like this have, have really um, become incredibly popular. So there'll be, um, there's been over 400 instances of uh, many publics deliberative processes taking place in dozens of countries around the world. Um, and they've been uh, convened to address a wide range of issues from urban planning, waste disposal, electoral reform, traffic issues, climate change and uh, biodiversity loss, um, to name a few. Uh, here in Aotearoa, there have been um, some small scale uh, uh, deliberative processes like this in the past. Um, although uptake has been fairly limited. As we speak, however, there's two really fascinating and exciting um, experiments going on. So um, down south from where I am in Porarua, uh, there are plans to organize a wananga. Um, this is a, a, I think a really um, exciting um, initiative. It's led by Mana Whenua in partnership with other local community leaders and groups. Uh, and it's inspired by the example of citizens assemblies overseas, but it also intended to reflect uh, tikanga and uh, in, to incorporate matauranga. Um, so it'll be really fascinating to see how, how that goes. Uh, at the same time, um, Water Care is working with my colleagues here at the University of Auckland in the uh, COI2, the Centre for Informed Futures. They're um, helping Water Care to convene a citizen assembly of uh, 40 randomly selected Aucklanders who will be considering options for the city's water sources in coming decades and making recommendations. Um, so, so this, this, uh, this uh, idea of citizens assemblies built on sortition or random selection is, um, is something there's quite a lot of experimentation going on with at the moment. It's not the only 
um, way in which sortition is being used um, around the world in, in recent years. Another example which, which I thought I'd mention is um, one from the US. Uh, so this is uh, a, an, a mechanism which is built around um, citizens initiated referenda. So in states in the US like Oregon and California, um, citizens have the ability to trigger a referendum on a particular issue. Um, if uh, it's something that's, that's actually uh, written by citizens and with enough um, signatures, they can, they can force a referendum on an issue. Uh, what they found is that citizens often don't know how to vote on these, on these um, referenda uh, and are confused by them. And some have passed that um, you would think in retrospect were pretty crazy. So um, to try and help citizens navigate the decisions placed before them, uh, some scholars and activists in Oregon developed a process they called Citizens Initiative Review. This, this is a process that um, invites something like usually 24 to 30 randomly selected citizens to spend two or three days um, looking into the, the measure that they're being asked to vote on, to interview proponents and opponents of it, um, and to, uh, to, to put together a fact sheet, essentially, which explains what the measure is, what it's proposing, um, and the strongest, the strongest uh, arguments for it and the strongest arguments against it. And they also report how the members of this citizen group intend to vote on the referendum um, after having spent three days um, looking at it in detail. So this um, uh, fact sheet is then included in the, um, the ballot papers as, that are getting um, distributed to voters in Oregon. And the legislature um, in Oregon thought this was such an effective um, tool actually that they've, they've now made it mandatory that citizens initiatives like this need to um, involve a citizens uh, review as part of the process. So um, uh, those, are, those are two um, kinds of uses of sortition. We have seen some, some um, even larger scale things um, like the Icelandic constitutional redrafting process from the early 2010s. Um, I think I might not sort of go through the details of that, although we can talk about it um, in Q&A if you like. Um, but um, th there's, there's now lots of research done on these, these kinds of decision-making processes involving ordinary citizens. And some of the results are actually pretty encouraging um, overall. I mean, the, the really the headline um, finding from the researchers who've looked at how citizens, ordinary citizens perform in these tasks of um, uh, political decision making is that they're incredibly competent um, given the right circumstances and resources to, um, to sit down and investigate and discuss complex policy questions. Ordinary citizens are perfectly competent um, to, to uh, reach uh, nuanced and sophisticated judgments. Uh, and uh, scholars who've sort of compared the, the, the deliberations of these citizen groups with the deliberations of uh, parliamentary assemblies and um, working groups and select committees uh, have reported that often the, the discussions um, in these deliberative processes, the citizen-led deliberative process are often more in depth, more technically competent and nuanced um, in the arguments than, than those of the professional politicians. Um, and surprisingly, on even on quite contentious issues, um, a diverse group of citizens can often come to um, bipartisan or cross-party consensus, um, even on such contentious topics as taxing and spending or environmental protection. And it turns out the more information um, participants have and the more time they have to discuss and deliberate on it, the more convergence they display. Um, and, and in part that's, I think, because people's values overlap more than we think. Um, and also in, in part because antecedent differences of opinion on political questions or policy questions tend to fade away when people have the opportunity to learn more about the issues themselves. And also when they feel obligated to make a conscientious decision that takes into account all of the relevant information and constraints um, that, um, that empowered political decision-making brings with it. 
Um, so that so citizen competence really is is one of the the um, the things which we've we we see in these um, in these processes. Uh, so so you and I um, people with with ordinary education um, um, or very low levels of, of 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 education in some cases um, make really valuable contributions uh, and add value to the deliberations and the outputs of these decision making groups. Um, I think another thing which is leading to enthusiasm around deliberation to, through, uh, sorry, leading to enthusiasm about sortition as, a, as an idea today is that um, you, when it's used well, it can create a really effective division of democratic labor. Uh, what it means is that yes, only a few citizens are empowered to make the recommendations on a given um, issue, but this exclusivity also has upsides. The use of sortition to delegate decision making to a subcommittee of the whole, as it were, somewhere usually between 20 and 120 people, means that rather than many of us engaging in a political issue in a shallow way, a few of us can engage in it in a deep and much more effective way. Um, and because there are a relatively small number of participants, the individual participants report a sense of um, very high levels of responsibility to do the work well and to come up with robust and defensible um, recommendations to consider evidence well, to weigh trade-offs um, in a responsible way. So this is a, um, a, a kind of a division of labor where, where we are ruled and ruling in turn, as it were. Um, and it turns out to have some um, significant advantages. Uh, one of the ways in which it does seem to be a step forward um, can be seen when we compare it to, to the way that um, government decision-making processes currently use consultative, consultative processes. So um, we know as, as legislation goes through the process that uh, select committees can invite contributions, can hold hearings, for instance. Um, but these kinds of consultative processes um, suffer from a kind of self-selection bias. And the people who do contribute and have the ability to contribute tend to be of a higher socioeconomic group. Um, they have the resources and the education to make a contribution. Um, and so you get a very skewed sample of, um, of citizens' opinion on, on um, topics because of this um, voluntary self-selection kind of um, process. Now, the, the contributors could be, can be, of course, adding value to that process um, undeniably and um, and motivated citizens who are particularly affected by issues have the opportunity to contribute and, and many will. Um, but sortition um, creates a different kind of dynamic where citizens who otherwise might not have had any particular interest in a topic um, are invited to consider it in depth um, and uh, their perspectives actually can, can contribute um, something of real value. So, yeah, so that's the idea that, that uh, the sortition process can, can help create a kind of effective division of democratic labor. Uh, the, the other feature of, of the sortition processes, which is often commented upon, is that um, they, they appear to be a way of insulating some political decisions from, um, from illegitimate influence. So when, when decisions um, are in the hands of well-known political decision makers, particular political office holders, for instance, it's easy for those office holders to be targeted um, by lobbyists, those who are able to wield influence over decision makers. Um, ordinary citizens who are invited into processes of decision making like this, like the ones I've just uh, described, um, are insulated from some of those uh, patterns of influence. And also from the kinds of incentives um, that come from the, the desire of politicians to, to be re-elected. Um, so there are pros and cons to that, which, which I'll come back to later. Um, but in some cases, that can be a real advantage. OK, so um, I'll, I'll finish up fairly soon. I just wanted to say a little bit about whether, whether these kinds of um, innovations the sortition based innovations that I've been discussing can be scaled up. I mean, the, the processes that I've described are mostly around particular policies and policy development. 
um, can concepts like sortition, rotation, deliberation be used to imagine a genuinely citizen-led system of political institutions in complex modern societies like our own? Um, and not surprisingly, democratic theorists are really interested in this question at the moment. There's been a lot of proposals um, published that, that seek to imagine whole political systems based on sortition, again, sort of reinventing Athenian democracy, but um, in a more co uh, complex form. I'll just mention um, some of the ways in which, which uh, uh, theorists have, have proposed that sortition might be used. Um, so the, the most obvious one is, is for policy development, as I've already mentioned. Uh, and, and it does look like this, this is a genuinely useful tool for policy development, particularly on questions, uh, on, on particular questions that, uh, that elected politicians struggle to, um, to reach resolution on. Uh, so, so where there's political stalemate, for instance, the abortion law case in um, Ireland um, fits into this category, uh, citizen-led processes can be useful. Where parliamentarians might have a conflict of interest, for instance, in setting salaries or rules of conduct for parliament or political funding laws, um, citizen-led deliberative processes um, could be appropriate. Where there are uh, political incentives uh, misaligned with good policy, and often this happens uh, where, where uh, political decision making relates to intergenerational long term um, investments. Um, the, those kinds of uh, so climate change is a is a is a um, obvious example here. Those kinds of questions can often be um, more effectively addressed by citizen led deliberations. And in fact, one of the most common topics that has been put to citizen assemblies around the world is the question of climate change and climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, so, so I think in, at least for some policy questions, uh, there's, there's um, potential um, here to use uh, citizens assemblies and even, even more complex kinds of questions, high level policy direction setting could be done by citizens assemblies, I think. Um, the downside of them, of course, is that um, they are costly, um, they're expensive to run, and um, they also require time from citizens. So the, 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 uh, the benefits in terms of the quality and robustness of decision-making really do need to be worth the costs. Um, and that's not always the case. Uh, another, another proposal that's, that's um, received some attention among theorists in recent years is the idea that um, our parliaments themselves should be either um, made up of members who are randomly selected citizens or that um, our elected representatives um, should be supplemented by um, some members of parliament who are randomly selected citizens or that the parliament should be subject to the oversight of a second body which is made up of randomly selected citizens. Um, so in, this is the idea, it's sometimes referred to as legislature by lot. Uh, and the arguments in favor of this kind of proposal are that, it, well, it would give us a more diverse set of legislators um, who are more authentically representative of the population, uh, that it might um, subdue some of the entrenched uh, antagonisms and conflicts between uh, representatives of political parties and also that it, it might help to overcome the problem that, that um, career politicians sometimes face perverse incentives arising from the, the need to secure re-election. Um, so th those are the, I think, to me, the main arguments in favor of this kind of proposal. My sense is that uh, legislation, the work of legislating is probably not, a one, not one that's well suited to, um, to being done by random citizens. I think that requiring citizens to, partic to participate in a legislative body for an extended period of time, say 12 months or more, is actually a really big ask in terms of, of time. Um, the practical barriers are, would probably make it impossible for the large majority of citizens to even consider putting themselves forward for that kind of role. Also, the work of a modern legislature is complex and technically demanding, and there's a danger that uninitiated citizens will struggle to develop an independent view on the merits of legislative pr proposals, and they'd be vulnerable then to the influence of more experienced politicians or officials 
Um, and finally, the, the irony here could be that if citizens are um, required to participate in a legislature for a long period of time, then over time, they would just become savvy in the way that um, elected politicians are and would become just like the people that they're supposed to contrast with. Um, so, so I think sortition based proposals, um, probably uh, sortition based proposals for, for legislatures probably, it, to my mind at least, don't, don't actually stack up. Um, but that's not to say that the way that we're doing legislation at the moment is the best way. I think there's, there's good questions to be asked about that. Um, it's just to say that it's not clear that replacing or supplementing elected legislatures with randomly selected citizens is going to be a net positive move. Um, just a, a, to mention a couple of other ideas that have been floated. Um, a, a third idea, so I've mentioned sortition for policy making. I've mentioned um, sortition for legislation. The third one I wanted to mention was what we might call sortition for democratic oversight. Um, and in fact, I was reading a piece by a democratic theorist a couple of months ago that's just come out in which he, um, he was proposing that um, randomly selected citizens could sit on citizen juries that could review important political decisions. So for instance, um, a citizen panel could review decisions to award major public contracts or scrutinize changes to election laws. Um, or scrutinize interactions between lobbyists and elected officials, or perhaps um, provide uh, scrutiny uh, oversight for public institutions that already have to operate at arm's length from government, such as the police or um, independent bodies like the Reserve Bank. Um, so the, the proposal here is that oversight and accountability could be, um, could be exercised by groups of citizens who are selected randomly and rotate. Um, so I think that um, this, this, this is an interesting proposal to consider. Um, we'd need to think about whether the advantages of, of ordinary citizens doing this work, um, uh, there are, whether there are advantages in ordinary citizens doing this work, as opposed to the, this sort of oversight work happening through courts. Um, but, but I think that's something that could be discussed. Finally, just one final um, uh, idea, which is not a theore theoretical possibility, but an actual um, innovation which has occurred just in the last few months. So in the city of Paris, uh, a couple of years ago, a citizens assembly actually recommended that the city of Paris adopt uh, an arrangement where there's a permanent citizens assembly. And the, the idea behind the permanent citizens assembly, which would have rotating members, so people would be on it for a term and then they would, other citizens would be elected, would be selected to, to sit on this body. The idea of the permanent citizens assembly is that it would sit alongside the city council. Um, so a hundred citizens would sit in this assembly. They would be empowered to propose bills to the city council that the city council could then debate. Um, they could review decisions by the city council. They're empowered to commission other one-off citizens assemblies on particular policy issues. Uh, they are also set up to be a point of contact between the council and peak citizens groups. So citizens groups, um, NGOs and organizations within Paris um, are able to kind of um, dialogue with, with this uh, citizens assembly, the permanent citizens assembly and their input can be conveyed to the council. Um, so this is an interesting kind of model because what it does is that it, it sets up a body of citizens as a kind of counterpart um, to the council, sitting alongside it, not above it or, or subservient to it um, with delegated responsibilities, but actually as a kind of dialogue partner to the elected representatives of the city council, strengthening relationships, adding accountability, and also enabling the flow of information through to council decision making. Um, and I believe that the first cohort of randomly selected citizens have accepted their invitations to participate in this um, permanent citizens assembly and uh, the first meeting will be taking place soon or might have even taken place in the last couple of weeks. So um, let me just conclude then and I, I wanted to say that I'm not claiming that sortition is the kind of panacea that can cure all of modern democracy's ills. In fact, to be frank, um, I think its performance, its sort of transformative potential has been oversold a little bit 
by its advocates. Um, uh, but I did want to give you a sense, a taste of, of some of the innovations that are being trialed and experimented with overseas. Uh, and I wanted to tell you enough about these different modes of political decision making um, to, to, to underscore the point, which is that democracy, the democracy of tomorrow could look plausibly quite different to the model of democracy that we've inherited. Um, so as um, in fact, under our noses, democracy is being reimagined and redesigned, at least around the edges of existing institutions. Um, and I've just talked about sortition based innovations. If I had more time, I could have um, spoken about how hundreds of cities have adopted a practice called participatory budgeting that enables local citizens to decide for themselves what public projects and initiatives should be funded by their city councils. Uh, and if I had more time, I could also describe how cleverly designed on, on, online platforms have been used in places like Estonia, Finland and Taiwan to enable community stakeholders to generate policy solutions to tricky uh, social problems. So there are other kinds of democratic institution, uh, innovations that, that we could be talking about. I've focused just on um, sortition based innovations tonight. Um, but uh, I think it's important that we we know about these experimentations and innovations that are going on overseas, because despite the trend, the overarching trend of democratic decline, we are in a period of democratic experimentation. Um, and you know, as we think about our own tetirity based future here in Aotearoa, I think it is important that we, we take a broad lens um, and we think creatively and laterally about um, what our democracy should look like. Um, and I think the challenge for us now as citizens is to, is to really employ our intelligence and our creativity to, to re-engineer our political uh, arrangements and institutions so that they really, they're, they're fit for purpose um, in the 21st century. We are running on a kind of democratic infrastructure, which is more than a century old in its basic design now. Um, and we need our political institutions to work for us. We need them to be fair. We need them to be inclusive. We need them to be forward thinking. We need them to be robust and adaptable. We need them to be resistant to corruption. Um, and, uh, and so I guess that's, that's where my own research um, is heading to think about these sorts of questions. Um, and I've appreciated the chance just to kind of share um, some of what's going on around the globe with you tonight. Yeah, thanks. Bill's muted. I'm very impressed with your outline to us, and thank you very much for taking the time and care to give it to us uh, and to develop it, in fact. Um, I was looking at the board in front of us, and there's a lot of um, very um, respected expertise in this community tonight that's joined joined the Facebook, uh, joined, joined the, uh, the Zoom. So I'd be uh, quite keen to get one of them to um, pop up as a as a um, as a contributor at this point. But maybe I'll start off. Um, Matheson, you didn't mention the possibility that, for example, our treaty decision making might come down to a method explored in this way. Um, there's a question then about how do you conduct uh, an election or a poll or a cross representative group? Um, what sort of roles do you use? What sort of um, uh, lifetime do you want do you want the group to, to have? It'll be an interesting comment to make. Do you have a do you have a view on this? Mm, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, 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 it's a complex one. I think that um, <coughs> constitutional transformation and particularly questions around um, how we best honour um, uh need to be approached in a really thoughtful way, uh, and in a way that um, gives political equality to um, Tangata Whenua in those discussions. Um, and so what that looks like exactly, I'm not sure. I think that um, 
Uh, but I do think that that uh, sortition based groups may well have a role. So, I mean, this is perhaps we could take a little bit of inspiration from uh, the Icelandic constitutional um, redrafting, which which happens in a very different context, but um, mm. uh, it is interesting to consider. So in, in Iceland, after the global financial crisis, um, there was a strong popular movement to press the um, political establishment for a constitutional redraft. Um, and, and the political establishment was un, unwilling to do this actually. So the, mm. um, uh, a group of, of citizens and in conjunction with NGOs and, and scholars um, um, initiated a kind of deliberative project to, to do that work. And roughly a thousand citizens randomly selected came together um, for a few days to, um, to brainstorm essentially what they wanted to see in the new constitution. Um, so there are models abroad, but I, I guess the main point that I would wanna make here is that there's already been one large and very impressive piece of deliberative work on this question which is um, the project led by Margaret Mutu and Moana Jackson, uh, which led to the Martiki Mai report. Um, and they, uh, I mean, this, this, is, this is a deliberative process um, that we should be very proud of here in Aotearoa, um, that under their leadership, something like over 250 hui um, were, were um, conducted up and down the motu, um, many, many um, people participated and contributed to those um, robust dialogues um, um, on, on what, what um, from, a, from a Maori point of view, uh, a constitution in Aotearoa would look like, which actually a constitutional arrangement in Aotearoa would look like that actually reflected the commitments of the treaty. So I think that that um, piece of work is already there um, and should be an important reference point for the ongoing conversation, um, but it's not conclusive. It doesn't. It doesn't um, uh, kind of lay out any kind of authoritative final vision. So there is need for ongoing dialogue, and I think that um, creating the right fora for that dialogue is really important um, uh, for the success of the project of constitutional transformation. And I do think that sortition may well be able to play a role there, at least in some parts of that process. Thank you, Madison. Are there any further? Is there a question here? I've got one. I think um, I think uh, Colin might have left the left the the meeting, so maybe I'll go to Bob. Have you got a question from your comment in the chat there? Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Phil. Uh, yeah, I've always been interested in the idea of things like sortition. And as I commented in the thing, that my view of, of a version of Greek democracy was the idea was a town meeting where everybody has a voice. And I think that becomes complex over our situation. And we also have bubbles, social, uh, the social network bubbles, political bubbles. And I think I spent my time talking to other Labour supporters. Well, how useful is that in the long term? And with sortition, with citizens groups from both parties, actually people talking, as you say, from this, actually wisdom might grow and actually listening to other people. Um, and as you say, that when you get groups of people together, that good things will come from it. So um, I'm very impressed with the idea of, of sortition. And I, I would certainly like to see that become part of our process. And thank you very much for what you said. Not really a question, more of a comment. Many, many thanks. Thank you, Bob. Jeff, do you have a question? Jeff Foley? Oh, Dee, Dee, I see you've got a question. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Phil. Kia ora, Matheson. Really interesting. Um, conversation you're generating and, and some really good thinking. I'm just wondering, so I work for the Public Service Association um, and I'm wondering how could how could this sort of, what, you know, is there a part that we as a union um, can play in this and, and, and what would, you know, from your thinking, what would that look like? Thinking that, you know, we have um, 
input into quite a few different areas of Aotearoa society and, as you say, different socioeconomic backgrounds through our membership and, um, you know, different organisations across the board, you know, how can we contribute to the conversation around these sorts of things as well from, from, from our point? Mm, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think I'm not sure how to answer it, to be honest. I think that um, I mean, firstly, having an awareness of, of what democratic processes can look like and should look like um, is a good starting point. Uh, I think that you know, the, the business of politics tends to run along particular lines and we do the things that we do and the things that we know how to do. Um, and so voices um, from, from the union and from other sectors that are saying, hey, look, things could be different and we could be doing this better, I think um, is already a step in the right direction. Um, I think, yeah, I, I need to give that some more thought. It's a, it's a good question, which I need to <laughs> reflect on more. The role of, of unions and public service um, association the sector in particular, I think is a really interesting question to think about. I guess one, one connected thought, I'm not sure this directly um, answers your question, but I, I think that our expectations of, um, of politicians and of public servants um, probably needs to shift. I think that what the, what the citizens assembly model kind of shows us is that actually political decision-making can be more of a conversation and a partnership between citizens and elected officials and public servants as well. Uh, and that actually the deliberation which takes into account the expertise and the perspectives of all those different groups actually can lead us to better outcomes. Um, and so I guess uh, this is sort of disconnect, not quite connected to your point, but I think that, that something I've become increasingly convinced of is that our elected officials, our elected politicians um, need to shift from viewing themselves as the sort of final decision makers, as the ones who are responsible for the deliberations and the decision making, to seeing themselves more as facilitators of a deliberative process, which includes input from public servants, it includes input from experts in the community, um, it includes input from um, stakeholders and those who are affect affected by decisions in the community, um, and it's a shepherding of that deliberative process towards a robust conclusion that I think is the ultimate responsibility of, of um, our elected politicians. Uh, and so that's quite a, can be quite a mind shift. I mean, there are deliberative processes, a lot of this is already happening on, on policy questions, of course, um, but I think there is a kind of a shift in our conception of what we expect um, our elected representatives to mm -hmm. be doing. Yeah, 100% agree. And, and we are starting, I guess we could say, motivate um, our members in the different sectors that we have within the PSA um, who are actually seeing influence. They are starting to influence some of that decision making at the parliament level and they are mm. through people power and and all that sort of stuff. And it's really heartening for us as a union to see our members, citizens of this country, communities, coming together for a common goal and actually physically being able to influence the changing and decision making. So, mm. yeah, I, I agree. I think us as a union and our membership um, can play quite a positive part in moving the conversation, as you say. Um, mm, it's, mm. I think it's a really exciting time for the citizens of New Zealand uh, mm. to become involved in these sorts of things. Mm, yeah, thank you. Just one, one other point. I have heard people from overseas who have been involved in, uh, particularly in these sort of citizens assemblies, many public type initiatives. They've reported that actually they've, they've received quite a bit of um, resistance from public servants um, who see them as a kind of a threat or a, a, a kind of imposition on the sort of work that they're competent to do, right? Um, and, and so I think there is a little bit of a, again, a kind of... Um, uh, rebalancing of how we see our roles and the kinds of roles that we can play in a cooperative system to generate good um, governmental decision making. Um, and so I don't, I think that there, there really is expertise and, and a, an important contribution that, that civil servants can make in political decision making. We shouldn't under, underplay that. Um, but it's widening that circle 
um, in order to, to get the best possible outcomes that, that I think we should be aiming for. Yeah, thank you. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Matheson. I've enjoyed this. Um, the, uh, the other example that we use of citizens' assemblies is jury service. And when you have a look at what goes on um, where a jury comes to a decision, there's a there's a huge infrastructure there of, in, of probably informing them. So I wonder what sort of support, once you set up a citizens' assembly, what sort of support to make sure that those assemblies are fully and properly informed. It would seem that the civil service would need to expand quite considerably. Mm, yeah, great question. There is some kind of practical expertise on, on just this question that's emerging overseas where they, where they have quite a lot of experience with doing this now. Um, and in fact, in some countries, I mean, even over in Australia, there's been quite a lot of this going on. And there are at least two or three in, um, organizations that have established themselves as facilitating services um, and uh, that, that provide, provide services to local governments, um, state governments to help facilitate these kinds of processes. Um, and and um, we have we have some people in New Zealand who, who do that kind of work, um, but it is it is a kind of um, professional role actually to facilitate these sorts of processes. So there is that facilitation part of the puzzle. There's also the question of um, who, who informs the citizens assembly and their deliberation. So um, that can be input from um, civil servants. Uh, but most commonly, actually, it's a, it's a parade of, of experts and invited people who <laughs> come and speak to the Citizens' Assembly and interact with them, provide advice and expertise on particular topics. So, um, so the, uh, the model typically goes, the model of a, of a full-blown Citizens' Assembly usually goes through different phases. It's kind of an exploratory learning phase where the citizens will interact with a series of, of experts and usually they'll be given some autonomy to, to choose who they want to speak to, who they want to um, hear from, so that um, it reduces the chance that the, the person who set up the citizens assembly can kind of stack the deck by, by just bringing in experts that, that will support the view that they're, they're wanting the citizens to um, endorse ultimately. Um, so citizens can have some, some autonomy in, in deciding who, who they want to hear from. Um, but then the next phase is more of a deliberative phase where they'll process that information, maybe seek more input, uh, work through some of the um, practical complexities in the issue that they're dealing with. Uh, and, then you, and then finally, um, try to come up with some recommendations and they'll vote on the recommendations to see what level of support they have among the participants. Um, so does that answer the question? Are you there, Jeff? Yes, thanks, yeah. <laughs> Are there any further questions? Matheson, can I just say thank you very much?